Good morning. Wow. Thank you. Wish my mother was still alive to hear that. That was fantastic. Yeah, indeed. So the, uh, uh, the drive down yesterday has left me with sort of an amphetamine stare like a truck driver on stimulants. So if you will bear with me. Um, also, like any good professor, I brought far more slides than I'm going to have time to show you. So we're going to be going through these rather rapidly, probably to the extent that uh, you may get a seizure disorder. So I'm glad that uh, Pat Quinn is here to take care of everybody. So thank you, Pat. Um, well, before I get going, let me just back up here and tell you that this is my last year of public speaking. I will be retiring from doing these at the end of the year. So I am very grateful to Lynn University, the administration and staff who invited me nearly a year ago to come and speak with you. But in preparation for my retirement from this sort of venue, uh, I have put all of my lectures on the internet at this website, and there are more than 10 hours for parents, 35 hours for professionals. The website is up. If you go there now, you will be charged a small fee to view these. If you will just wait a couple of weeks, then uh, the lectures will be for free and also will be streamed on YouTube. And I'm also working with a foundation in Madrid that has translated all of this work into Spanish. And that website will be up within the next couple of weeks as well. So hopefully before the end of February, all of this material will be there in addition to other lectures that I've had on YouTube and so on from other universities. So very grateful to these organizations for sponsoring that program. Uh, today, very quickly, I'm going to talk about self-regulation and executive functioning, especially as it applies to ADHD and its implications for management. This is a lot to cover in a very short period of time. Uh, indeed, I wrote a whole book on this several years ago uh, on executive functioning that came out uh, in 2012, and I'm going to try to summarize that book uh, in less than one hour here. So let's see if I can achieve that goal. First of all, I would like you to know a little bit about just the history of executive functioning. Most people use this term, indeed, we could even call it a fashion trend right now, in psychology, education, neuroscience, and so on. But there are a lot of problems with this term that get glossed over that I think we need to appreciate, not the least of which uh, is that its extensive use is, uh, I think, far exceeds the scientific basis for this construct, particularly when you see that there are more than 20 definitions being used in various articles on executive functioning. They can't all be true. Now, most of these refer to the executive functions as those cognitive abilities needed for goal-directed action. Uh, but that is a relatively useless and very ambiguous description because many human actions can be involved in goal-directed behavior, and we wouldn't think of them as being executive. For instance, if I happen to walk from my car to a hotel or into this conference center, that's a goal-directed action. But no one here would argue that walking is part of the executive system. I certainly wouldn't. So our problem with this very broad definition is it's not operational. It doesn't help us to cut through the more than 400 psychological traits that have been uh, uh, cataloged in the human psyche and tell which of those are executive and which would not be executive. So the term executive function has sort of evolved into a meta construct. It refers to a list of subordinate constructs and yet no one seems to be able to specify how you get on that list or how you stay off of it. Uh, in general, however, most neuropsychologists would agree that executive functioning is the basis for human self-regulation. And we're going to use that as a start to get out of the woods or out of this quagmire of definitional uh, ambiguity. Certainly, we can argue, as have many people, including Prybrum and Vygotsky and Lurie and others in the history of executive functioning, have argued that this is the highest faculty of humanity. And I would argue, as I did in my book, that this is the principal adaptation by which humans survive on this planet. And most of us would certainly attribute a good deal of these functions to the prefrontal cortex, though there are many other networks that I'll describe for you this morning that are implicated in these networks uh, or in this, uh, this construct. So as I've said, there are more than 20 definitions in the literature, and they are often subsumed under what is this umbrella term. And more than 33 human psychological abilities have been attributed to 
to the term executive functioning, which, by the way, is nearly impossible. But you see, when you have a very ambiguous definition, anything goes. You can pretty much list any construct under there, and no one has a basis to challenge you. And that's pretty much what's been happening in the field. Another problem that we've encountered here is that if your definition is poor, and there are too many definitions and too many constructs, it leads to a problem with clinical assessment of that construct. And I'll show you some of the problems that we have with executive functioning shortly. Just a short list of them you will see here as well. Because of this problem with assessment, we've seen more than 500 academic articles published on executive functioning in the field of ADHD alone. And reviews of that literature have concluded that ADHD is not an executive disorder, which is astounding, but that's what they've concluded. And they've concluded that on the basis, largely, of all of the psychometric tests that were used in the, uh, this literature. Uh, as I will show you, there is a big problem with relying exclusively on psychological tests, but at least you can see why these reviewers were reaching this conclusion. Basically, they were saying that most people with ADHD or with autism or with other difficulties do not have executive deficits on psychometric test batteries, and therefore ADHD cannot be an executive disorder. Perhaps a subset of them have executive deficits, but we have to go searching for other theoretical explanations for the disorder, which people have. They've been looking at motivational explanations, arousal explanations, or what are now called multi-pathway explanations as well. Some people are delay-averse, some people have motivational problems. Yes, a few of them have executive problems, but none of those deficits are universal to people with the disorder. But stop for a moment. ADHD has to be an executive disorder, and it has to be for one very simple reason. Carl Pribram is the first person to invent the term executive functioning, and he applied it to the prefrontal cortex. So if ADHD is a disorder of the prefrontal cortex, then logically it has to be an executive disorder. So which is it? Either the neuroanatomy of ADHD is wrong, or the reviews of the literature are wrong. Well, the neuroanatomy is not wrong. We have an abundant literature from neuroimaging, especially functional neuroimaging, and most recently looking at the microstructure of white matter in the human brain that clearly demonstrates that ADHD is a prefrontal cortical disorder and that it also produces detrimental effects throughout networks that originate in the prefrontal cortex. There are at least three, probably four networks in the prefrontal cortex that you see listed here, but for the sake of time, I'm going to just show them to you. The most important that we have is from the prefrontal cortex back to the posterior cortex, particularly into the right hemisphere, but also using the anterior cingulate at the midline of the frontal lobe up in here. See if I can get, well, that's not going to work very well. But in any case, we have a cortical, cortical set of networks. This is the origin of human self-awareness and self-monitoring. The second network goes from the dorsolateral cortex on the outside surface of the frontal lobe back into the center of the brain to a large structure known as the basal ganglia. This is known as the what network. This is where what you hold in mind, the working memory system of the dorsolateral cortex, so mental information actively held in mind, is going to transfer forward and control the motor system. What I think guides what I do. So that's a very important system, often referred to as the cold cognitive or cold executive system, because it involves simply cold intellectual information. So holding in mind that guides behavior. The third network, again, originates up in the prefrontal cortex, but this time it is going to run through that basal ganglia and back into the cerebellum. This is the when network. It is responsible for the timing of human actions and goal-directed behavior, so that the timeliness of behavior is as important as the plan itself. When you do it matters. And so this is known as the when system. And of course, it has to explain very nicely why ADHD is the most severe disorder you can have with regard to time management. ADHD is two to four times worse than any other mental disorder in impacting the capacity of people to manage themselves relative to the passage of time. So ADHD is, in fact, as I said in my adult handbook, time blindness. People have a myopia to the future, and now we know the network that's producing that. 
The last network I want to speak about goes from the dorsolateral cortex through the midline of the frontal lobe, known as the anterior cingulate, and back to a very small structure here, which is the amygdala. And the amygdala is the gateway into the limbic system. And you know the limbic system is the old, primitive, emotional brain that goes all the way back through reptiles and even further in evolution. So here what we have is a network that controls how you feel based on what you think, but also your feelings inform your thoughts. It's a reciprocal system. So what you hold in mind is going to have an impact on how you feel about it. This is a motivational system. It's an emotional system. It's the brain's appraisal network. This is, of all of these networks, the final determiner of what you choose to do. It will select the human action that you're going to execute through the executive system. As Damasio said, you cannot make decisions unless the cognitive content you're thinking about has some affective or emotional valence welded to it. Otherwise, it is purely rational information that has no personal meaning to you. It is the personal meaning, the emotional tone of your thoughts that helps to decide among the various options. So I think of this as the appraisal network of the brain when it comes to decision making, particularly with regard to conflicts among various consequences that will ensue for various things, options you're thinking of doing. So we have at least three and more likely four networks here that are involved in the executive system. And without a doubt, every meta-analysis of functional neuroimaging in ADHD, as well as structural neuroimaging, implicates these networks in the disorder. So I come back to the point. If the frontal lobe is the executive brain, as Prygram said it was, and ADHD is clearly having a detrimental effect on the development of the frontal lobe, then ADHD has to be, logically, an executive disorder. So where has the literature gone wrong? Well, as I've said, ADHD involves that executive network. But when you give psychometric test batteries, executive function test batteries, on average, only about a third of people, at most 50%, but it's usually lower than that, are found to be impaired on these tests, leading clinicians and researchers to conclude that this particular patient or this group of patients does not have an executive disorder. And yet, when we give rating scales of executive functioning, you can see here that nearly 98% of adults with ADHD are impaired. By the way, impaired means you're in the bottom 7% of the population in your functioning on the dimensions of these rating scales. So which is it? Both of them claim to be measuring executive functioning, the test batteries and the rating scales. Most neuropsychologists side with the test batteries. That's a big mistake, because as I'm about to show you, the rating scales are vastly superior to the test batteries in detecting executive deficits in human life. And we know that because, first of all, these two measures do not correlate with each other at all. There is no significant relationship between test batteries and rating scales, both of which claim to be assessing this dimension. That is not possible. One of these has to be wrong. And you can see that they share less than 10% of their variance with each other. So these are not measuring the same things. Now, how can we get out of this dilemma that we seem to be in? And this graph illustrates this dilemma very nicely. This is from our study of a large sample of adults with ADHD. And you can see here that these adults are impaired on an executive function rating scale that you have over here. And here's the test battery given in this study. And you get a diametrically opposite conclusion. Fewer than 20% of the people in this study had a deficit on any of those tests. Now, you might say, oh, well, but you didn't use my favorite test battery, Russ. Well, here's another study. This is the Milwaukee Longitudinal Study. It uses a completely different executive function test battery. Same rating scale. Here we split the ADHD children into those whose disorder persisted to age 27, those who were starting to outgrow the disorder or move into what we call a subclinical, subthreshold range. That's the ADHD NP, non-persistent, and the control group. You see the exact same pattern here. The more persistent your disorder, the more the rating scales are reporting that you are seriously impaired in executive functioning. But you drag out the test battery, and virtually no one in those groups is impaired on that test battery. 
So it isn't just one study. This is the result of every single study of this issue, rating scales versus tests. You wind up with completely contradictory conclusions. So which is right? Well, to get out of this dilemma, my colleagues and I took our test batteries, took our rating scales, and took all of the data we had on major life activities. We have your criminal records, your driving records, your educational history, your medical. We did complete physical exams on these individuals. We also interviewed your employers and so on. So we have a variety of measures of major life activities and whether or not you're impaired in those activities. And the vast majority of these activities, such as educational functioning and occupational functioning, are rife with executive functioning, right? They have to be. So which of these measures produces outcomes? The rating scales. The rating scales account for 45% of the variance in impairment across these measures. The tests, 6%. In other words, the tests aren't predicting a damn thing. So consequently, we are left with the conclusion that if you want to know how well a patient is functioning in their life and be able to predict whether they are going to suffer impairments from their disorder, the rating scale, hands down, is the measure to use, without a doubt. You can forget the test. It's not correlated with anything. It's not predicting anything except academic achievement, and it won't even predict academic achievement if you co-vary IQ. Because after all, these tests are simply other versions of IQ measures. That's why 40% of an IQ test picks up executive functioning. So the problem that we are faced with is virtually every clinician, particularly in neuropsychology, is using an executive function test battery to make high stakes decisions about thousands of people in this country every day using a measure that cannot do what it says it can do. Assess executive functioning. That is a big mistake. Indeed, some would argue that is negligence. For you to be using an instrument that cannot do what it says it does, and you are making decisions about whether people get social security benefits, disability, insurance, whether they get high stakes uh, exam accommodations, whether they get ADA accommodations on this campus, all of those decisions are being made by test batteries, and the test batteries are failing us miserably. We have a huge dilemma here. So as I have been arguing for the past two years, we have to stop relying exclusively on test batteries to make these decisions about whether or not people have executive deficits, whether or not certain psychiatric disorders or learning problems are associated with executive deficits, because anything done exclusively with a test battery is going to be severely limited. This also, I think, creates a huge problem for building theories of executive functioning, most of which have been built on top of these psychometric test batteries. And as a result, the theories are, I would say, at best are severely limited and at most are wrong-headed. Now, why would these test batteries be so problematic? We have to go back to the definition, to the concept of executive functioning. What is it? We know from the work of Fuster and Stuss and Benson and many others, all the way back through Luria, that the purpose of the frontal lobe is to bind events across time. As Fuster said, if you have to pick a single overarching function of this complex set of networks, it is the cross-temporal organization of behavior toward an anticipated future event. The executive system is a forward-looking adaptation, and it allows you to bind different events over time periods in order to anticipate and prepare for and get to a goal. It is future-directed. Well, if that's the case, no executive function task can pick that up because they last only about 10 to 15 minutes each, at most 30. How can you predict cross-temporal behavior? Humans have to plan weddings, for Christ's sake. And you give a little 15-minute planning test, and you start to pontificate about the individual's ability to plan in their life. You haven't even come close to assessing what humans do across time in their life. The second problem with these is that the frontal lobe, as people have concluded, through Lezak in her textbooks on assessment, back to Stuart Diamond and many others, including Lurian Vygotsky, the frontal lobe is the seat of our social intelligence. It is a social organ, not a cold cognitive organ. 
So consequently, none of these cold cognitive test batteries come even close to assessing the major reason you have a frontal lobe. And that is because you live in groups with other people with whom you have to get along, with whom you have to reciprocate, cooperate. Those are the functions of the frontal lobe, not digit span backward. Because if you think that, then you think what Phineas Gage lost when he had a pipe blown through his frontal lobe back in 1848 was his ability to do cogmed, digit span backward, spatial memory. Oh, that was the most severe thing. Poor Phineas could not detect an X from an O on a continuous performance test. That is laughable. What Phineas lost were the social functions of the frontal lobe, which was because, or why he became practically psychopathic. So we have to take a look at these tests and start to see whether or not they pick up social functioning. If they don't, they're going to be pretty useless for assessing executive functioning. Also, the executive functions involve emotional self-regulation. There is that affective network, that why network of the frontal lobe into the limbic system. These tests have no means of assessing emotion. And finally, as I have argued in my book, besides reciprocity and social cooperation, the executive functions are responsible for culture. Culture is shared information that spreads rapidly across a group of primates that are able to imitate each other. And we build upon the culture of past generations. So there's a reciprocal interplay between the frontal lobe, the previous culture that surrounds it, and then the contributions it will make back into that culture. Culture is the scaffolding of human executive functioning, and we use it to accomplish our goals. And no prior theory or definition of executive functioning ever spoke about culture. That's a big mistake. So we can now see why executive function test batteries cannot do the work we ask them to do. How do we get around this? I think we start by going back and trying to redefine our terms and come up with a theory of executive functioning that can do the work for us, the heavy lifting of assessment and treatment of these individuals. We're going to start with self-regulation because that's the most common attribute of executive functioning. We have a very good definition of self-regulation. It is, first of all, the capacity to direct an action at yourself. So a self-directed action, which is then used to alter your subsequent behavior from what it would have been had you allowed the automatic brain to continue on its course. So self-directed action that alters the subsequent behavior, and why are you doing that? To change the future. Executive functioning and self-regulation is about what is coming next, not what happens now. It is always future-directed. You are altering the probability of a future event either increasing or decreasing it through your self-directed action. Now, this is a very well-known definition of self-control that goes back to Skinner in 1954. Now, how can we use this definition to help us define an executive function? Because an executive function is that self-directed action. What are you doing to yourself to alter your behavior? Humans do seven different things sets of actions to change their behavior so as to alter their future. And each of those actions or classes of actions can be thought of as an executive function. And now, finally, we have the operational definition we need to know what psychological ability is and is not executive. And the litmus test of that is going to be, is it self-directed? If you direct it at yourself, it's executive. If you direct it at the environment, it isn't. And now you know why walking is not an executive function. But talking to yourself is. So are some of the other executive functions. So we can resolve this paradox by using self-regulation, defining an executive function as a type of self-regulation, as the action we do to ourselves. And there are seven different kinds that will evolve in a stepwise fashion over the course of child development. Little children do not start out with one kind of, or with, with a, a, one self-control. They have multiple forms of self-control, and they start out in a stepwise sequence. And each needs the one before it to develop, before it can move on and develop itself. And so there are seven of them, and we use them 
to solve problems and create opportunities within a social existence. So we can organize these into a hierarchy. So if we take a look at our executive functions, we see that there are at least six or seven that neuropsychology has identified and labeled as follows. Self-awareness, inhibition, verbal working memory, nonverbal working memory, emotional self-regulation, self-motivation, planning and problem solving. These are the biggies, are the ones that everybody agrees on. But by using the term that neuropsychology uses, we get nowhere. We have to go back and redefine each of them as an action to the self. What are you doing to yourself? Well, the first one, self-awareness, is you've turned the attention network on yourself. Self-directed attention. Then you get the next one, self-restraint, executive inhibition. Then the third, you see to yourself. The third executive system is nonverbal working memory, and we can redefine that as the visual imagery system. Humans use resensing of visual images in order to guide themselves. Like a GPS in your car, you are holding a map of your past in your head that guides you across time. And then you start to talk to yourself, which is the fourth executive function, the verbal working memory system. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then you begin to direct your emotions at yourself. And now you have the self-regulation of emotion and along with it, motivation. The frontal lobe is the source of self-motivation. The ability to sustain action over time in the absence of consequences. Self-motivation. And then finally, we get to the planning and problem-solving module. How can we redefine that as an action to the self? It's play. It is the penultimate goal of human play. We play to ourselves. We do it manually to begin with in early childhood, and then it slowly becomes internalized and symbolic in form. And you can manipulate images and words in your mind to create novel combinations of previously existing material. Mental play is the basis of planning and problem solving. And we have known that for years. There is a direct correlation between children's play and adult problem solving. Play is not just for leisure. It has an extraordinary, important human function. It is the basis for planning and problem solving. So you see, in a Vygotskyan sort of way, we can take, take each executive function and redefine it as an action to yourself. You see to yourself. You hear to yourself. You talk to yourself. You feel to yourself. You play to yourself. And you monitor yourself, among others. And what makes them executive in form is they're self-directed and they're being used to alter and guide subsequent behavior. <clears throat> One of the most important things that comes out of the executive model or this view is that this is a limited capacity system. This is effortful. This is the slow brain, as Danny Kahneman wrote in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, last year's one of their best sellers out there. Beautiful book, by the way, about the executive system. But the point here is that this takes energy. This takes work. This is volitional, self-directed behavior. And that's effortful, which means there's a limited fuel tank, and you can exhaust this fuel tank very quickly by using each of the executive functions. And if you combine them and you sustain the demands on this system for a certain period of time, say minutes to a few hours, you exhaust the system. And what happens then? In the next situation in which you need self-control, you will not have it. You will collapse. This is the ADHD child at the end of the school day, which is why it is foolish to try to do homework with one of these children when you have exhausted this executive system. <clears throat> and by the way, you can also deplete the fuel tank through illness diseases, other sorts of things, including drug abuse. The point is this, it's a limited capacity system. So be careful how long you tax the system. You leave the person open to executive failures in subsequent situations if you tax it too long. 
Now, as the executive system matures, it is going to alter what is controlling your behavior. Two-year-olds are over here on the left-hand side. Two-year-olds are controlled by external events in their sensory fields. They are being controlled by other people. All they care about is the temporal now. And as a result, all they are thinking about is what I get now, immediate gratification. But over the 30 years it takes the frontal lobes to complete their maturation, human behavior is going to move from being regulated by these dimensions to being regulated by the ones on the right. Mental information becomes increasingly important in guiding human behavior. It also allows us to wrest control of our behavior from other people. We start to develop independence and self-regulation. We also start to anticipate the future further and further and further out, and this leads us to start to value delayed consequences. Larger, later consequences become increasingly important as we progress through the first 30 years of our life. So we can look at it this way. We have a very young child who lives in the temporal now. Here's a future event that's coming at them. By the way, you will not deal with an event until it enters your time horizon. Not your mother's, not your teacher's, yours. Little children have a time horizon that is very narrow. The window on time is very closed. But as they develop, that window begins to open and they start to look ahead. Eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, 24 hours. And then they start to prepare. And then as they become adolescents, it starts to become about two to three days, maybe five days at most in the older teenage years. Then as they move into the 18 to 24 year bracket, they get down here, excuse me, about one to three weeks. And then by the time you're 30, you're up at the eight to 12 week area. That is where most of you are preparing for future events. We know that because we collected your calendars. We can see when you start to make entries. Notice the human time horizon expands markedly. But we need to keep in mind that teenagers are here and we are here. And that is a massive temporal conflict. And this explains why you have so many arguments with teenagers. You are looking ahead. Have you done your summer reading? Are you ready for this weekend? Have you got your college application ready to go? And your teenager is living right here. All he cares about is where are we going tonight? Who's my date this Friday night? That's it, right? This conflict of time horizons is a major source of disagreements between parents and teenagers and between college staff and teenagers. So the point here is this. Number one, understand the difference in time horizons as a function of development. Give it a rest, would you? Right? They don't live here. They live here. And either you get into this window and help manage it, or you will not be influential over their behavior. By the way, I see hands going up. Please don't ask questions. We have no time for that right now. <laughs> <clears throat> Pun intended. Sorry. All right, so from that perspective, we have a suite of networks that give us at least ten or seven rather self-directed actions that allow us to regulate our behavior over time to alter our future for our own welfare. That's the executive system. Now, how does ADHD fit into that? Research shows that the executive system is a single construct, probably self-regulation, just like G on intelligence tests. If you factor analyze an intelligence test, you get one monster factor. But it is also valuable to split that factor into two broad bands. For IQ, it's verbal and nonverbal. For the executive system, it's inhibition and metacognition. We can then take those broad bands, and just like an IQ test, we can split them into narrow bands, just as we do with the verbal tests and the nonverbal tests. And we can do that with executive functioning. We can split these into narrower bands, understanding they are highly correlated with each other, and all of them answer up to that monster mother construct. Now, what happens with ADHD? we can now see that ADHD symptom dimensions are actually subsets of the two executive function broadbands. They've just been mislabeled. The inattention dimension is not inattention. It's metacognition. And of course, the inhibitory dimension includes all of these capacities for inhibition. Not just motor, not just verbal, but also cognitive, and affective. People with ADHD are highly emotional, as I will talk about this afternoon. 
So when your frontal lobe matures, it helps to keep in mind that you are going to get seven different developmental capacities that interact to guide behavior over time. So with maturation, we see an increase in human complexity of human action toward the future. We also see a spreading of human action across space, three-dimensional space. Then we see it spreading across time. The individual begins to start directing behavior forward in anticipation of the future. As a result of that, the individual starts to value delayed consequences. The individual is also capable of using higher order rules or abstract rules now to guide behavior instead of concrete commands. But most importantly, all of this is being done for two purposes. The first is the expansion of the social network that the individual uses for their own welfare. These are your friendships and your family relations and others. And the individual begins to reach out and adopt the culture around them as the scaffolding they need to accomplish more and more complex goals extended out over time. And eventually, if they are particularly innovative, they will give back to that culture through new inventions of their own. And so there is a bootstrapping across human generations in the amount of scaffolding available to the next generation that wasn't available to the last one. My father did not live to see the invention of the smartphone. Yet all of you rely on these devices, or most of you do these days anyway. So the frontal lobe is a very complex organ, and it gives us these developmental capacities. Now, how can we build this into a model? What I did in my 2012 book was to create what I called an extended phenotype, borrowing the metaphor from Richard Dawkins in biology. Dawkins has argued that phenotypes extend out into the ecology to produce effects at distances quite remarkable in space and time from the organism. And to the extent that those extended effects feed back to influence your welfare and survival, they can be considered part of your phenotype. Your phenotype does not end at your skin. It extends out around you, into the culture, into the things that you use and you develop, how you organize your life, and it extends out over time. So how can we go from these seven cognitive faculties and extend them into the social environment to understand what they do? Now, to give you some idea of what I did, I took Michon's model of driving as an analogy. If you want to evaluate somebody's driving, you have to evaluate all four levels of driving. You can't just start at the first level, the basic cognitive level, which is reaction time, vision, motor movement, coordination. These are the prerequisite cognitive and motor abilities you have to have to operate a vehicle. But if I brought you into a lab and I gave you a test battery of only these tests, could I predict your driving? No. You would need to be missing half your brain for that test battery to tell me anything about your driving. These are necessary but completely insufficient faculties to understand driving. We need to move up the next level of driving, the operational level. How do you operate the vehicle? You have to learn to interact with the vehicle, learn its properties, and use that. This is what you do when you take your teenager into a parking lot to teach them how to drive. Then we get to the strategic level, or excuse me, the tactical level, which is how do you drive in the presence of other drivers? Now we have rules of the road that have to do with subordinating your activities to that of other people so that we can all get where we're going with the least amount of conflict, the tactical level. And then finally, the strategic level, which basically answers the question, why the hell are you driving? <clears throat> what are you doing with this car? Are you running errands? Have you structured your errands in the most rational way, the most cost-effective way? What happens if there's an ice storm like there was yesterday? Are you able to re-engineer your plans around these obstacles? That's the strategic level. Okay, we can use that and build a hierarchical model of executive functioning as an extended phenotype into social ecologies. Number one, the instrumental self-directed level. That's those seven executive functions. But they extend upward into what I call the Robinson Crusoe level, which is the methodical self-reliant level. You begin to use them for your own care, and your own self-guidance, and just as important, social self-defense. Humans prey on each other, and you better be developing a psychic immune system, if you will, from the influences of other people 
around you. Otherwise, you will be an extraordinarily gullible individual. The third level is where we then move up from social self-defense and independence to reaching out and reciprocating with others as we build social networks that we can trust. This is reciprocity, and it is the basis of economics, markets, social exchange, as well as social skills and human etiquette. It's a very important domain of human functioning. And lastly, we get into cooperative activities. We do things in groups we cannot do alone. Cooperation is not reciprocity. Reciprocity is tit for tat. I help you, you help me. Cooperation is where we team up to accomplish a common goal and share in the consequences. We are constantly forming and dissolving teams around us in order to do this, especially in the workplace. We can now define executive functioning as those self-directed actions needed to choose, enact, and sustain actions toward a goal. We do this largely in a social context, reaching out to use others as part of our goal-directed behavior and relying on cultural inventions as the scaffolding for goal-directed action. Now, that's a definition of executive functioning. What does this tell us, then, about executive disorders? It tells us that executive disorders are going to contract and collapse that hierarchy. They're going to start to restrict their development so that we know that these individuals are going to have problems with all levels of the executive system, which means they're going to be having problems with time management, self-motivation, emotional self-control, planning, problem-solving, and so on. But it also means that we are going to see a contraction in the time horizon. They are not going to be able to deal with futures as far ahead as other people are able to do. And the more severe the injury, the greater the contraction in those frontal lobe capacities for reaching out across space and time to anticipate and plan for our futures. As a result, we are going to see a gross adverse effect on the hierarchical nature of human behavior. It's going to become less complex, less temporal, more involved in the immediate situation, and more involved <clears throat> with immediate gratification. So if we look at the hierarchy of executive functioning as I have built it, what we see is that disorders of the executive system begin to collapse the hierarchy. And the more severe the disorder, the greater the contraction, to the point where if you are like Phineas Gage and you lose most of your prefrontal cortex, you may lose your entire executive system and your survival is at stake. <clears throat> so go back and look at those capacities that the frontal lobe is giving you as it matures and understand that ADHD and other disorders like it, but especially ADHD, restricts that development by 30 to 40 percent. So if you want to know how far behind somebody with ADHD is in self-regulation, conservatively take 30 percent off their age, that's where they are. By the way, the rule of thumb applies to about 24 to 30 years of age, and then that's it. It's over. That is where you are going to stay through the rest of your lifespan. So this helps you to understand, then, where are the clients we serve in their executive capacities. On average, people with ADHD are about 30% behind their age, which means that if you're about 16, you have the self-control of a 12-year-old. If you're 21, it's that of about a 14-year-old. Eventually, by the time you get up into your late 20s and early 30s, hopefully you're somewhere around 18 to 22 years of age. But you're not 30. You will always continue to make less mature choices than other people are likely to do. But the point is this. The concept of an executive age allows us to adjust our expectations, to change the environment around the affected individual in order to work with the executive age we have, not with the one we want. And that reduces conflict. <clears throat> so it pays to think of the brain very simplistically as a knowledge performance device. The back part of the brain is where you acquire information. The front part of the brain is where you use it in daily adaptive functioning. And ADHD separates those two parts. So it doesn't matter what you know, you can't do it as effectively as other people. You can't use your learning and your information for social effectiveness over time. You can get 800s on the SATs and you will do stupid things. <clears throat> so it doesn't matter what you know. What matters 
is do you apply it? Knowledge by itself is useless unless it is applied in human life for effectiveness, for adaptive and social activities. So how then do we understand ADHD? We can understand that ADHD disrupts the executive system, causing a severe time blindness, leading to a contraction in the hierarchy of the system, a contraction in the temporal and spatial and social aspects of the individual's life. Since the executive system is future-directed, ADHD is IDD, Intention Deficit Disorder. It means that ADHD is a disorder of performance, not knowledge, a disorder of doing what you have learned, not of knowing what to do. And the only way to deal with a performance disorder is to restructure the point of performance, the place in life where the problem is occurring. The further away in space and time you are from that point, the less effective your intervention will be. Performance disorders must be treated at points of performance. We know that to alter the executive functioning of individuals over time, we are going to have to work within these five domains. Information, maturation, accommodation, medication, and modification. So what are the implications of an executive view of ADHD? Number one, the implication for treatment is obvious. This is not a skill disorder. Stop skill training. These people are not stupid. And yet we bring them in and act as if they don't know. Little children have no friends. Oh, you need social skills training. ADHD adults can't manage time. Oh, you need time management training. People with ADHD have lousy working memory. We have them practice CogMed, digits span backward every night for 45 minutes in the belief that we have somehow altered the executive deficit. You haven't even come close. So the point here is this. Don't focus on the skills so much. Restructure the point of performance. Follow what I call the 80-20 rule. 20% skill review to make sure they've got it. 80% changing that point of performance so that they show it. The goal is to show what you know, not to sit around and teach. The teach and pray strategy failed. It's time to give it up and move on to engineering environments around executive deficits, altering the scaffolding. Second, We have to design prosthetic environments and keep them in place. These are artificial alterations that help reduce the individual's impairment from their executive deficit. But a prosthesis does not get rid of the disorder. It reduces impairment from disorder. A ramp into this building is a prosthesis for people in a wheelchair, but it does not get you out of the wheelchair. It allows you to do something you couldn't otherwise do in that environment. Remember, impairments are always setting specific. So we are trying to lessen impairment from your disorder, re-altering, redesigning environments. The third, of course, is making sure it's at the place where the problem exists, not in an office, not in a pullout service, not in a summer camp in Michigan. Where is the problem? That is the environment that requires restructuring. We need to understand that in the case of ADHD, the origin of these deficits is largely neurological and genetic not social, not a choice, not due to video games or TV or your diet. So we have the most striking neurogenetic disorder in psychiatry in ADHD. What does that mean? It means that if you have a biological disorder, it is completely humane and rational to use psychopharmacology to compensate for that disorder. It is like insulin to a diabetic. Indeed, I tell patients ADHD is the diabetes of psychiatry because it brings to mind the treatment model that you have to have in place in order to deal with this disorder. But it also speaks to the need, often, for neurochemical alterations of the brain to help manage that disorder. We can now refer to ADHD medications as neurogenetic therapies. That is not hypothetical. We have a very good idea where they work in the brain, the alterations they make. We are even learning the genes and their polymorphisms that are building and operating these networks and how the drugs alter them. Perhaps someday in the near future, we will simply do genetic testing in the office to tell us which drug is best for your kind of ADHD. So this is a neurogenetic disorder. Neurogenetic therapies are completely rational and humane to be used with these individuals. 
Now, one thing I do want to point out, one of the greatest discoveries of the last five years in ADHD research, which you will never hear in the New York Times because it is so biased against psychopharmacology for children. We now have 29 studies that show that the longer you stay on your medication, the more normal your brain becomes. So that children who take medication have brain development and brain functioning much closer to normal individuals than people who never take medication. By the way, this is only children. There are no studies of adults. And I'm not sure that it would work in adults anyway because the brain is a lot less plastic. But notice, by using these medications to keep these executive networks functioning at a higher level, you may start to see neuronal sprouting and brain growth in the areas that are crucial to executive functioning. This is known as neuroprotection. And just last week, a meta-analysis of all of these studies was published arguing that we have evidence that ADHD medications may well partially normalize brain development. And you won't hear that in the media. What does that tell you about the bias of our media at this point in time? That is a major discovery. Now, we also need to understand that because ADHD affects timing, ADHD is not an excuse for misbehavior. We do not excuse you from the consequences. If the problem is timing, the solution is to tighten them up. The solution for somebody with ADHD is not no consequences, it's nearer consequences. Closer in time, more frequent, more salient, more accountable to others. The way you treat a temporal disorder is by adjusting the temporal parameters in the components of a contingency. If ADHD is destroying the cross-temporal organization of behavior, then stop requiring cross-temporal organization and make it much more immediate, much more salient, much more frequent, and more accountable to others. Behavioral interventions do this beautifully, but we need to understand that behavioral interventions aren't training you out of anything. They are a prosthesis. They are an artificial means of sprinkling artificial consequences out there in the environment where they don't naturally occur. They are ways of tightening up the temporal accountability. But just because you do this does not mean you have trained this person out of anything. Remember, there are two reasons you do behavior modification. One is instructional, which is why you do it for children with intellectual disability. Two is motivational. And if you do it for its motivational properties, which is why we use it for ADHD, you cannot stop doing these things. So what that means then is that the compassion and willingness of others is the linchpin to successful treatment. Are other people in the environment, the caretakers, the stakeholders, willing to modify points of performance to create that additional scaffolding, those additional accommodations to facilitate this individual's functioning in that environment? Now, here are just a few things you could do if you wanted to practice your executive functioning. But time doesn't permit me to go into those. I want to focus on these. There are several ways you would alter the point of performance to help somebody with ADHD or any other executive disorder. Number one, remember, mental information is not guiding behavior. The working memory system is deficient. So what's the solution? Put the information back in the environment where it originated. The word is externalize, as Vygotsky implied. You are more under the control of things in your sensory fields, so get the information back out there. I need you to externalize time, because the internal clock is broken, using timers, clocks, counters, and other timing mechanisms. We need to break lengthy tasks into very small quotas, self-pacing, so that the individual doesn't have to cross-temporally organize or sustain. We are going to break the goal into smaller chunks and have the individual do smaller chunks at a time. We must use external motivators rather than relying on internal motivation. That's what token systems do, points, privileges, money, all of those sorts of things. External motivators. And then we must make problem solving manual rather than mental because they can't hold the pieces in mind in order to manipulate them to solve the problem. Finally, we need to remember that the executive system is a limited resource system and make sure that we do not defeat the system by demanding executive functioning for too long at a time. There are various ways of dealing with that fuel tank. I'll just list a few as I conclude here. If you want to boost your executive functioning, these are the things that will help you with your self-control.
Notice they involve breaking tasks into smaller units, using external reinforcement, using statements of self-efficacy and encouragement, using brief periods of relaxation in which you give the executive system a break, visualizing your goals and your consequences, and routine physical exercise improves the executive system and expands the fuel tank. Finally, the entire fuel tank is based on blood glucose in the frontal lobe. So if you have protracted work to do that is effortful, like taking a high stakes exam or doing homework, you better be sipping on some lemonade or a sports drink or something that creates a low infusion of blood glu glucose into that frontal lobe, because that is the basis for all of that resource pool. So I hope you can see then that ADHD is an executive disorder, even if the test batteries don't pick it up. That the executive system is an extraordinarily important system, complies of at least seven mental faculties that then feed forward into human life to give us these five dimensions of human activity. And these activities are the basis of our social relationships, our cooperative activities, and our culture. And all of this is put at risk in individuals like those with ADHD who have either injuries or neurogenetic disorders of the executive system. Thank you. <clears throat> You're welcome.